good morning. It's uh, good to see everyone this morning. This morning we're going to study the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Jonah says, I won't go. <laughs> he doesn't even say that. <laughs> All of his actions show that he won't go. The book of Jonah. We'll begin in a few minutes. I just want to welcome everyone here. It's good to see everybody. Glad to see all the smiling faces. Good to see you. Glad to have all our visitors here with us. Uh, before we begin our study this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day that you give us. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the rain that you sent our way. And dear Lord, we're thankful for our visitors here with us. We ask that you watch over them and protect them. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for each member of this congregation. Lord, we ask that you bless their lives we're thankful so much for their faithfulness to you. And Heavenly Father, we pray for our elders. We ask that you be with them, give them knowledge and wisdom as they lead this congregation. We're so thankful for these men. We're thankful for our deacons. We realize and acknowledge the hard work they do for your kingdom. And we're so thankful for them. We're thankful for Sam and Corey. We are thankful for their ability to teach your word. Lord, we're thankful for your holy word. And we ask that you be with us each and every day as we study that we'll grow in knowledge of your will and apply what we learn in our lives each day. Help us to live closer to you. And Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are sick. We pray for Julie undergoing her treatments, that you'll be with her doctors and nurses as they give those treatments and that her good health will return. We pray for all those that are sick. And we ask that you be with them, give them strength, give them encouragement. Help us to love them and to support them. And Lord, thank you so much for Jesus that came to this earth and lived as a man and died on the cross for us and shed his blood. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. The book of Jonah, the book of Jonah. Uh, the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. Uh, Jonah... As we start to read, Jonah was the son of a, a Mithai. The rest of his family is unknown. He came from the town of gath Hepfer, 2 Kings chapter 14. He was of the tribe of Zebulun, Joshua chapter 19. He prophesied for Israel under the reign of Jeroboam II in 2 Kings 14. There are four great lessons that we learn from Jonah. One is Jonah running away from God and also running away from his duty to God. The preaching at Nineveh, Jonah's anger, we're going to see that, and God's mercy. Now there are four things, or five things, that God prepared in this book. He specially prepared them. One was a great wind. What was another? A great fish? Uh, a gourd? What else? To go with that gourd. A worm and a violent east wind. Those five things God prepared in our study of Jonah. Nineveh was one of the greatest of all heathen cities. It was located on the east bank of the Tigris River. It's about 400 miles to the Mediterranean Sea. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. 
bitter enemies of the Jews. God told Jonah to go preach in Nineveh. And Jonah did not say no, but his actions did, didn't they? He ran away. He ran away from God. But he learned very quickly, can't run away from God. And he was a, what I would call, he was an unwilling missionary. A very unwilling one. And the people repented. And when the people repented of Assyria, in Assyria, it was the greatest conversion of people on foreign soil in the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Heathens. Um, Jonah seems childish. He seems almost, as we study through here, he, he seems almost clannish. And the reason I point that out is he seemed childish in his disposition. But you know what that teaches us right off as we study? That God takes everyone, regardless of their disposition, regardless of their personality, to accomplish his will. There's hope for us, isn't there? Hope for us. And so that's what... Uh, God used here. He used him, even though he has this disposition that we're going to look at, God still used him. Nineveh had five walls and three canals that guarded the city. Three or four chariots could ride on top of the wall side by side. They had great palaces. They had a, they had a, a, a beautiful garden. There were 70 great halls that were scattered throughout the city. This city was humongous. <laughs> this city was big. Jesus himself made this an important book. Before we start with Jonah chapter 1, I'd like for you to turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus himself made this book important. And the people asked for a sign to prove that who he was, who he said he was, and all of his his words that he spoke, and they wanted a sign. And he said, no sign's going to be given to you except the, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, beginning of verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And we'll come back there here in a little bit, look at something else in the next two verses. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai saying arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, 
and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And I'm going to stop there. Let's go back to verse number one. Verse number one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Jonah came from the tribe of Zebulun. He prophesied during the reigns of Jeroboam the second and also Joash, the kings of Israel. In verse 2, he said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. And Jonah was given the mission from God to go to this great heathen city, bitter enemies of the Israelis, of the children of Israel. Nineveh was the Assyrian capital. Wicked city, enemy territory. So verse 3, Jonah arose and he did what? He flew. <laughs> he took off. Jonah had no intention of obeying God, none whatsoever. He had no intentions of going to that place, did he? He may have even said to himself as he was heading that way, he may have even said to himself, preach to it? I want to destroy it. That was his attitude. And he may have said that to himself. Now, let me ask you a question. Why did Jonah not want to go? There may be several reasons. Why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I mean, here are the enemies of the children of Israel. They hate the Jews. The Jews hate them. And they wouldn't blink an eye to kill him, would they? And he's afraid for his life. That's one reason. What's another reason that he wouldn't go? He didn't even say, I'm not going to go. He, 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 just, he just left and went in a totally opposite direction. What could be another reason? I'm sorry? Lack of faith that God will take care of him and lack of faith to do what God has told him to do. Lack of faith. Anybody else? Wonder why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. What if, <laughs> speculation on my part, that's all this is, speculation. What if he preached and they repented, then God has favored them, a heathen nation. God's favored them just like the Jews. God's not supposed to favor anybody else but the Jews, is he? Could that have been a reason? There are many reasons, and every one of them that, that was mentioned in class just a second ago are all valid reasons why he did not want to go. That's exactly. It is, isn't it? Uh, that's exactly correct. He uh, he was being selective on who heard God's message, but he thought, as a Jew, that it's only us, and God's going to teach all of us a lesson here. Uh, he's not going to argue with God. He's just going to run away, and he's going as fast as he can. And not only is he disobeying God, he's going totally in the opposite direction. Total opposite direction. He went to Tarshish on the, on the uh, seacoast, and he bought a ticket to go to Tarshish. And he went, not only did he buy the ticket, he went down into the bottom of the ship. Tarshish is uh, somewhere near Spain somewhere near the, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar. And he went in the bottom of the ship. And now he's riding in the devil's ship. But you can't hide from God, can you? I, I want to look. I don't want to throw us off, but I, I want us to look at some other examples of somebody making an excuse why they can't do something. Look at, uh, look at Genesis or Exodus, I'm sorry. Exodus chapter 4. 
Exodus chapter 4. Hold your place there, but look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has appeared, has not appeared to you. He's full of, he's full of excuses, isn't he? God has appeared to him at the burning bush. It's a miracle. And he's trying to make excuses. What if they won't listen to me? And then he tells him to take the rod throw it down, it turns into a snake. He picks up the rod, remember, and it goes back to a rod. Then he told him, take your hand, put it in your belly here and pull it out, and it'll be leprous, leprous. And he said, then put it back, and he put it back, and then it came out healed again. Then he told him, take, take water out of, the, out of the river and pour it on the sand, and it'll turn to blood. He gave him all these signs, but now look what, it's, look what he said. In verse number 9, uh, I'm sorry, oops, verse number 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow to speech and slow of tongue. He must be from Texas, huh? <laughs> if he's like me anyway. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, and who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have I not? Have not I the Lord? Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. Verse 13. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send by my hand of whomever else you may send. Pick somebody else. So the anger... Verse 14 of the Lord was kindled against who? Moses. Moses. And so look what he said. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well, and look, he is coming out to meet you. Verse 15. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. <laughs> His excuses were about himself, weren't they? There's one more I want you to look at. I want you to look at uh, uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. I mean Luke chapter 14. I'm sorry, boy, I'm having trouble today. Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. Luke 14 beginning at verse 15. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to them, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said to him, Jesus did, A certain man gave a supper and invited many. Then he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are ready. Verse 18, But they with all one accord began to make excuse. And the first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I have to uh, ha I ask you to have, to have me excused. And another said, I have bought a yoke of, five yoke of box and I'm going to test them. And I ask you to be excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant reported all these things to the master. And the master said, Go quickly out to the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And so they did that, and there was still room. Verse 23, Then the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. They were filled with excuses too, weren't they? Filled with excuses not to serve God. And Jonah ran the other way. <clears throat> Verse 4. The Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. 
The Mediterranean Sea can get nasty, just like any sea and ocean. Great storms come up on it. But this was done by God, and it was all of a sudden, they had no warning. Here is this mighty tempest and great wind in the sea. It was so bad that the ship was about to be broken up. In verse 5, then the mariners were afraid. Listen, these are professional sailors. When the mariners get afraid, look out. <laughs> we need to be afraid if we were on that ship. So the mariners are afraid. They're throwing cargo over. They're trying to do everything to lighten the load. And, and, and they're crying out to their false gods to help them, but there will be no answer. And all that time, where is Jonah? He's in the bottom of the ship, and what's he doing? He's asleep. And so in verse 6, the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll have mercy on us. Verse 7. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots. And so they cast lots, and, and the lots fell on Jonah. Heathen people, you know, they thought the storm was because of some person. Someone on the ship caused the storm. And you know what? They were right. <laughs> they were exactly right. God caused the storm because of Jonah. And everybody on board cast lots, and the lot fell right on Jonah. Look at verse 8. And they said to him, please tell us what's the cause of this trouble? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? In verse 9. So he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah gives them a straight up answer. Does he take responsibility for the storm? Yes, he does. He took full responsibility. Now look at verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that, they, uh, that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you? And the sea may be calm for us. And the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. Verse 12, and he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land, but they could not try or could not, for the sea continued to grow more, more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord prepared a great fish, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. <clears throat> Verse 10. The men were afraid. They were it says, exceedingly afraid. They were scared silly. And he said to them, why have you done this? And he told them, I ran away from God. And, and they say, what shall we do to you? In Verse 11 so that the seal calmed down. And what did he say? Throw me into the sea. <laughs> if you'll throw me into the sea, it'll be okay. They didn't want to do it, did they? Did they want to throw him in the sea? No, they did not. Nevertheless, they rowed, didn't they? They tried to make it to land. Why didn't they want to throw him in the sea? What could be the reason that they didn't want to throw him in the sea? If you were on that ship and somebody told you to throw them into the sea, would you? No. Not unless you just had to. <laughs> in your mind, you're thinking, well, okay, I know what he said, but I gotta, I'm responsible for this whole crew. 
I'm responsible for the lives of everybody on this ship. And I know what he said, but we're going to try to get to land, didn't he? They just didn't want to do it, but they couldn't make it. They rode hard trying to get to land, but they didn't make any headway. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and he threw him into the sea and the sea ceased its raging. Just as soon as he hit the water, the sea calmed. <clears throat> We're human, every one of us, aren't we? We got our fears. We got our things we, that really bother us, so, uh, that, that are heavy on our heart every day, something in our family, something on the job, something everywhere. And... And we're fragile humans, and we make mistakes. And sometimes we may even feel like, boy, it is so hard to obey God. But you know what? Put that aside. Put your fears and your, your feelings that you have, put it all aside because it's always better, isn't it, to do what God said. It's always better. It always turns out for the best. It's always what God expects of us. And it's better to obey than try to run away. <clears throat> Verse number, uh, let's go to 15. Oh, that's where we were. So they threw him into the sea. And the sea calmed. And the men on the boat feared the Lord. And they, they, had a, they had just had a demonstration of God's power, didn't they? The one true and living God calmed the sea. He can do anything. And they just had this demonstration that God controls all things. And look what they did. They offered sacrifices to God. They took vows. What's that remind you of when... The sea was calm just as soon as he was thrown. What's that remind you of? Is there? Huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, I, can't, I can't pass this up. <clears throat> I'd like for you to look at something. Huh? Uh, he's talking about when Jesus walked on water, and, and I'm going to look at a different, a different aspect of it where the wind... And the wave obeyed Jesus. Look at uh, look at Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter eight, beginning in verse twenty-two. Luke eight in verse twenty-two. It, it's just always amazing to see the the power of God. Verse twenty-two. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat and his disciples said to him, come, said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake and they launched out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and they were in jeopardy and he said, and they came to him and awoke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and they were a calm, and there was a calm. Look at verse 25. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water. <laughs> That's just amazing, isn't it? How much... God controls this entire universe and this world we live in. That they even, the winds and the ocean will even obey his voice. And then when he was on the sea and the storm was raging and he walked on water and Peter said, I think I can do that too, can I try? And he did, didn't he? <laughs> For a little bit, a little while. And then he began to sink. And what did he say? I'm sorry. Save me. Save me. And he reached out and he saved him. A 
Okay, let's go back to Jonah. <clears throat> Verse 17. Hey, watch my time. Now the Lord prepared that great fish to swallow Jonah. And he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The Hebrew word is sea monster. We have no idea what kind of creature this was. We have no idea what kind of fish this was. We don't know if it was a huge whale or a great fish. We don't know. But we do know what? There's one thing we can be certain of. We don't know if it's a whale. We don't know if it's a fish. We don't know if it's whatever. But there is one thing we know. What is that? I'm sorry I heard that. God sent it. God prepared it. Whatever it was, God prepared it. <clears throat> Go back to Matthew chapter 12 again. Matthew chapter 12. You know, if God prepared it, that should be good enough for us. Give me time to get there. Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 40. Matthew, well, let me get there. Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 40. For as Jonah was in the, for Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now look at this. <clears throat> the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Isn't that amazing? And they rejected Jesus. And he's greater than Jonah. Any questions or comments so far? Chapter 2, verse number 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. He's inside that fish's belly or that whale or whatever it was that God prepared. He's inside that belly. And Jonah cries out. He prays to the Lord and he answers him in verse 2. You, verse 3, you cast me into the deep. The billows and the waves passed over me. Verse 5, and the waters surround me, even to my soul. And the deep closed around him. And he had weeds on his head. Verse 6, the earth with its bars closed behind me. Jonah's describing what? He's describing his conditions inside that whale. <clears throat> Verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. My prayer went up to you. Verse 9. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah repented. He asked God for help. And what happened next? When he repented and he asked God for help, what happened next? The fish upchucked. <laughs> the fish threw him up on the shore. And there he was. He saved him. He, God's going to give him another chance. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days journey in extent. God has given Jonah another chance. Verse 2, he told him to go back, arise, and go to Nineveh, and go to the great city, and, I, and, and preach the message that I tell you. Nineveh needed God's message. The whole world needs God's message, doesn't it? It needs preachers to preach the word in truth. Remember this one preaching, one sermon, it was the greatest conversion of heathen people on foreign soil in the Old Testament. 
verse 3. Nineveh is a great, or Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Some historians believe that it was the largest city in ancient times. It may have been over 30 miles long or maybe even longer, 10 miles wide. We, we, These are just estimates. It was a huge city. And Jonah entered the city, verse 4, on the first day. And the text says that it's three-day journey in extent. Now, I don't know if that means uh, it takes three days to walk across the city or three days to go around the city, but that doesn't matter. What the main point is, verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. That's the main point. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Here's an amazing thing to me. Just one sermon by Jonah converted an entire city of heathen people that were not Jews. People will believe that there is a submarine that you can put 100 people in and you can be underwater for six months to a year and never see the light of day. We believe that. We ain't never been on a submarine. Most of us in here, I was the entry guy. I don't know about no, any submarine, but I believe that. We believe that Armstrong walked on the moon. We saw the picture. <laughs> we believe that. So why in the world is so dis distressing, <laughs> it's so upsetting that people reject the Word of God and these children of Israel rejected God's Word. And here was a... a they, they were preached to thousands of times, weren't they? The children of Israel preached to by every prophet. Every one of them preached to them. Jesus preached to them. They all rejected them all. And here's the heathen people that believed and obeyed and put on sackcloth and ashes and spared an entire city from one sermon. That's a powerful sermon, isn't it, when, when he's a reluctant missionary. He brought the city to its knees, even the king. The whole city repented, verse 8 and 9. The king did the same thing in verse 6, and the king sent out a decree in verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Can you believe that? <laughs> and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, was this... Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, take my life from me. Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city where he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. He can't wait, can he? He's up there sitting on the wherever. He made himself a small shade. He just can't wait to see what happens to the city. They're going to be destroyed, he thinks. Verse 6. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it to come over Jonah then it, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was grateful for the plant. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened, verse 8, when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself, and he said, Is it better for me to die or it is better for me to die than to live? 
Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even unto death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on a plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. Verse 11, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and uh, right hand and their left and much livestock. Verse 1. It displeased Jonah. It, 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 uh, it made him angry. It made him mad that here I am preaching to these people. They're not even Jews. They're a heathen race. They're our enemies. They're hated by the Jews, and the Jews hate them. Look at Jonah's attitude. It should be a day of rejoicing. It should be, he should be happy. Instead, he's mad that the city's not destroyed. God saved the bitter enemies of the Jews in verse 3. Please take my life from me. Earlier, he had rejoiced, hadn't he? Because he was saved out of that fish's belly. And now, he's ready to die. Verse 4. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? An angry or a person that gets mad, just, it, it just doesn't do very much good, does it? And God asked him, is this the right attitude for you to have? Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city. He made a shelter. He put a little shade over his, his self, and he waited there, sitting there, waiting to see what would happen, to see the city completely destroyed, and it wasn't. They repented. They turned to God. Verse 6, and the Lord prepared a plant or a gourd. I like the gourd myself. And by the providence of God, this plant covered Jonah and the shade eased his burden, eased his misery. And Jonah's grateful for that plant. In verse 7, but as the morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm and he destroyed that plant. And if we've all made a garden, we know what it's like when the worms get in there. It does make us mad. In verse 8, God prepared a vehement east wind. When the sun came up, God prepared a blistering, scorching wind that came off of the desert. It had to be hot. And the plant withered and gave no more shelter, and the sun beat down on his head till finally he had heat exposure. He became faint, but he's still mad at God. He's ready to die. Verse 9, now he's even mad at the plant. And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be mad at this plant? Jonah was a great man of God. But here he is showing he's still mad at the city. The people had not obeyed. He thinks he, that God's only supposed to favor the Jews. He thinks he'd rather be dead. And he's even irritated at the little things, isn't he? A gourd. <clears throat> verse 10 but the Lord said you had pity on a plant for which you ain't not worked for which you didn't make grow which came up in the night and perished in the night why shouldn't I have pity on Nineveh verse 11 there's more than 120,000 people in this town 120,000 and they're like small children. They need to know about God. And God is telling Jonah, you don't have the right attitude. You're not willing to share God's love. You know, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jonah's weeping, weeping over Nineveh, and it's for totally opposite reasons. And God is telling him that the city is a lot more important than what? A gourd. 
a lot of lessons that you and I can get from the book of Jonah. You've been a very good class. And next week, we're going to look at a survey of the minor prophets. Any questions or comments before we stop? Thank you.